Welcome back to The Rant. In today's episode, I have a very special guest who needs no introduction. Mo Pinnell, scientist, visionary, all things radical. Mo, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, and I hope you feel that way when this whole thing is over. You know what? This is a treat for me. I've been wanting to hook up with you for a long time. All right. Be so careful what you ask for. You may get what you want. <laughs> Fantastic. That, that's what I, that's exactly what I'm hoping for. So let's get started. So one of the things we were talking about um, off camera was uh, we're going to do a couple segments. And today's segment is really your story and how you got into ball designing and some of the key achievements. How did I get into ball designing? Yes. Well, after a mediocre athletic career early in my life, and my engineering training at Cornell uh, when I was like 27 years old, which makes it 1969, I drilled my first bowling ball. And I found that interesting. Like I said, mediocre athletic career, did a lot of different things, a little playing tennis, a little car racing, a little this, a little that. And I started to get into bowling. And it intrigued me because it was a balance between science and athleticism. And uh, I started there in 1972. I had a very productive year and made a bunch of money and uh, decided to try and join the PBA. Well, so I got a very good old friend of mine, Joe Donato, to sign my application. And I didn't have a 190 average for the previous two years. Cause like I said, I was only new in the game. So Chuck Pisano was nice enough to tell me that I couldn't join the PBA cause I didn't have a 190 average for two years. Now it's a 200 average, I believe for two years. Right. That was interesting. So I bowled my first two regionals back to back weeks and made the finals of both. And at the end of two weeks, he told me I had to join the PBA, which I found <laughs> completely amusing. Right. So once I started that and uh, I did PBA bowling for about four or five years, but in the process of learning and uh, I got the black Bible for ball drilling from or for ball fitting from uh, Bill Taylor and I managed that. And then I said, well, that's you're not taking into account the the flexibility of the thumb and the, the thumb angle pitch and everything. So I started modifying what he had done. And I began to realize at a very young age because of the engineering training that, no, that I thought with the same amount of athleticism, there were some days that I killed them and some days when I was just flat awful. Okay. too much of a range based on the athletic contribution to the game. And then I started uh, looking at bowling balls. And an interesting thing happened in 1973. My father was a patent attorney and a metallurgical engineer. So I've got that. I was speaking patent at the age of 14. So that kind of training and that kind of thought process. So, you know, the environment I grew up in. It. Okay. And I started noticing that I didn't think bowling balls were being made to enhance, to enhance their performance. They were just being made to make production easy. So with my dad's help, with his obvious engineering training and his patent, I sent a letter to the two big companies at that time, which were Columbia, because they had just done white dots and they were doing, uh, they didn't do yellow dots until 76, they had just done, started to do white dots. The different colored white dots had different hardnesses of covers. And Ebonite. So those were the only two companies that were really out there. Okay. So I sent him a letter. And I said, gentlemen, I'm looking at your bowling balls and uh, they don't look to me like that they're being designed to enhance ball performance. <laughs> they look like they're just being designed to make them easier to make for you guys. Well, if we sign a non-disclosure letter, I'd be willing to sh do some designing for you and show you how to design cores or bowling balls so that they'll roll better 
to find the function on the lane. And I got the same letter in intent from both companies. They said, basically, who are you to tell us how to make bowling balls? <laughs> and if you sign a release, we'll look at your ideas, but we're not signing any letter of intent. So in 1973, they said, who are you to tell me how to make bowling balls? Well, I had a great time in 1991 when they learned how to make bowling balls. Right. So that was my motivation. And you, you don't put a loaded gun in a lunatic's hand. You just don't do it. Right. So that's where it started. And I started playing with shapes. Uh, my physics is, is not bad. It's not great. Just like my engineering, like I was telling you earlier, you know, when I was in engineering school, we used slide rules. And like I say, most engineers today would hurt themselves if they try to figure out how to use one. Yeah, they wouldn't so, even recognize it. Right. So I started uh, playing with core shapes and designs. And uh, the first ball I designed was the original shark for track. And who do you think was president of track at that time? I'm going to take a guess that it was Phil Cardinelli. It was. Okay. So, yeah. So, Phil, he was working for a company, Paul Seagott at the time, who had inherited a bunch of Star Treks from uh, Dick Haas after he sued Dick Haas and Dick Haas didn't have any money to pay the bill. So I said, let's, you know, I've got some ideas. Let's make some bowling balls. And Phil was always creative. And uh, we designed the shark. Okay. And uh, we made some prototypes. And Kelly Bednar was on Facebook talking about how that changed his life. Because he was, he now works for the USBC but uh, he was uh, running a pro shop for Chad Seacrest at the time in Raleigh. Most of this happened in Raleigh at Buffalo Lanes and nice people there. Frankie was managing. So we did the design. And uh, then in 1991, Bob Benoit was throwing a shark and broke the qualifying record for the Masters. He was, wow. We were in Toledo. So he broke the qualifying record for the Masters. Now, I just the wanna, interesting I just wanna... thing that really happened to this whole thing was uh, in November of 1990, PBA had their original tournament. They used to have at Olympic Bowl in Rochester, New York. We made a bunch of prototypes and uh, we did a ball test. There were seven bays in or six bays at the Olympic Bowl in Rochester. We used to call it six miles of bad road. And they were wood at the time. So some had been sanded one year, some were sanded the other year. It was always, it was a great tournament because it was challenging. And we, between qualifying and the first round of match play on the second afternoon in the old format, uh, Phil scheduled a ball test and we took the back bay and did a ball test. And we had five or six guys throwing balls. Wonderlick was throwing them. Benoit was throwing them. Uh, Dave D'Entremont was throwing them. There were about six guys throwing them. And uh, everybody was watching. And at the same time, Bill Supper at that time was working for Ebonite. He watched that test. And Ebonite was trying to get AMF's business because AMF had just done the Cobra which was a tremendous success. And, they, and Columbia had been making Ebonite's balls. So he said to Ebonite, well, we want to try, a, try, we had talked a little bit, we want to try and do a design and have Mo Pinnell design it and you manufacture it and we'll test it and we'll see how that goes. Hmm. So I gave them the Sumo design and uh, needless to say, they liked it did the ball test in Toledo in March. Like I said, at the Masters, it was an Olympic ball, uh, uh, Imperial at Toledo. And the ball won the ball test. And the next thing I knew, uh, we had balls that were going to be called the AMF Suno. And Peter Cohn was their manager of the consumer products at the time. And 
Next thing you know, sumos were on the market and I became persona non grata in San Antonio, Texas because the sumo moved the entire AMF line, which was big at the time, from San Antonio to uh, Hopkinsville. And it's very interesting how long lives things come around and turn around. Right. Randy Kitloff, who was who is brilliant, by the way. He's got seven and en seven engineering degrees and, and he does lots of great cover stock work. And he was vice president of manufacturing at EBI at Ebony. Yep. Well, we're back together again. That's what I've so heard. So it was kind of fun. I was glad to, and uh, you got to give Brunswick credit right now. They're accumulating a whole lot of talent Yep. in that one little building they've got up in Muskegon, Michigan. They've got seven brands, Radical being one of them, which is my responsibility for, for the designs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Randy Tightloff and Ray Edwards and Brian Graham. Mm -hmm. And let's just say there's a whole lot of talented people in one place. That's a lot of smart people. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when the business opens up again. I just want to touch because on... right now we've got Brunswick and Storm. <laughs> When's the last time there were two manufacturers in the bowling industry? I think you mentioned it just previously. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. So it'll be very interesting when things open up. Yeah, Coke versus Pepsi. I just want to touch on something real quick because I, I don't want to make sure viewers didn't miss it. Radical's not the first time you and Phil hooked up. You and Phil hooked up back in the track days. The original track days before track was bought by Columbia from Paul Seagot. Right, it was yeah. Star Trek back then, right? Yeah, when it was when, when Dick Haas had it, it was Star Trek. And it's funny because I threw my first 300 game in 1972 with a blue Star Trek. All right. I'm just curious, what was it like the first time you and Phil sat down to talk? I believe it was over a cocktail, so we'll just have to eliminate <laughs> half that conversation. Fair enough. Okay, so going back forward, you did the shark, you did the AMF sumo, became persona non grata. When did the ninja come up? The ninja was right, was after the sumo. We did the sumo, and then we did a ball called the plastic sumo, which was an interesting thing because when we manufactured them, they were made out of what Andy Lee, rest his soul, who was in charge at Ebonite before <clears throat> Randy Tightloff. Randy Tightloff had just been hired. He made what he called elastic plastic. Okay. It was a plastic sumo. There was one thing that was different about it. It was a different type of plastic. It had a good roll pattern and a little more friction. Problem was, is when you manufactured them at 72 hardness, 10 days later, they were 66 hardness. Mm. that's that yep yeah the, the, the resin hydrolyzed so we did that and the sumo was going good and uh then eb and i came to me and said amf wants another ball and i want a reactive resin ball we're starting to get into a reactive resin and that's where the ninja came along interesting we made a small modification to the sumo design and we made the ninja and the ninja was the first resin ball that came from me okay and you designed that core yeah i designed the core that was in the ninja okay and that got pretty successful there was a lot quite a few versions of it there was an in the mass ninja master ninja fury uh the ninja rpm which bobby learned broke the world's record for the tv show scoring pace and still holds to this day interesting i did not know so that that's where bobby learn and i started well that was the second time we got together okay we had gotten back together way back in my days when i was bowling and i was in erie pennsylvania and i was bowling in what was called the classic bowlers association and like i said i knew that when i bowled it was never only a reaction a reflection of my athletic ability that day it had a lot to do with, did I have the right ball in my hand and didn't I have, did I have my feet in the right place? Because in 1979, the Classic Bowling Association used to run a tournament every other weekend somewhere in Western New York, 
Western Pennsylvania or Eastern Ohio. And in 1979, for 230 or 40 games, I can't remember the exact number then, I became bowler of the year in the Classic Bowling Association. I averaged 237 for over 200 games in 1979. And you're a lefty too, right? Of course. Yep. There are five things I can do with my right hand, but I can't tell you that on this <laughs> program. All righty. Now, I've got three words, and I want to know what you have to say about it. Hammer 3D offset. Lots of fun. That's when the world learned how to make a bowling ball. Let's talk about it. How did it come to be? What was your involvement? What was the genesis of the idea? Well, you're going to hear a lot of names that, that I've had a ca casual relationship or a passing relationship in this business. Now, I don't know if that's because I'm hard to deal with or whether I'm just flaky, but we'll let everybody make up their own mind on that one. Fair enough. Uh, the new, well, at Ebonite, we had been doing the AMF stuff. And Ebonite decided for some reason that uh, they went to AMF and said, you know, you're paying these guys so much for every bowling ball as a royalty, but you don't need him and you don't need them because they're just using our expertise is what they told the AMF and the new manager of consumer products uh, said, okay, so we'll eliminate Mo Rich, which was myself and my partner, Rich Saddle. So as soon as they eliminated us, Dennis Baldwin called me from Hammer, which was Fabol at that time in Baltimore. Yes. And they had have been having a bad time trying to make reactive resin ball. They were, the biggest, they were the biggest ball seller with the blue hammer. And then resin came along, they went right down in the toilet. Okay. So he said, why don't you come up here to Baltimore and make a bowling ball for me? Well, I didn't have anything else to do. So I went up there. So I went up there and we made a deal. And in 52 hours, I developed the original 3D. Mm. And at that time, that's when I... I had known him as a bowler. I got to meet West Pie. So West Pie in 52 hours, West Pie and I developed the 3D, the 3D, the original 3D. So we did the original 3D. In fact, I had to change Wes's grip so that he could continue to bowl because he tore his hand up in the first practice session. Ooh. I said, we haven't got any time to screw around here. So let's just change your grip so your hand can last. So his hand lasted for 53 hours. Uh, Robbie Sapp was, was the tech at Fabol, and he was good. Okay. Because we actually made four designs in 52 hours. Wow. What he used to do, because he was a, a craftsman, right, is he used to just make the, the negatives, the positives rather, the, the core, cut it on a wood lathe. So he cut it out of wood on a wood lathe, coat it with silicone, and then he put it into a metal container and we made a mold out of it. Right. So we did that four times. And that was the that was the original 3D. We used that in the solid, in the 3D solid and the 3D uh, pearl. Well, while that was going on, I had a little idea in my head. And I said, well, we get pinouts in these balls by shifting the core laterally a certain distance in the ball. Okay, and uh, we could get a pinout and we were looking for pinouts two to three inches at the time. Okay, so I'm sitting there looking at a 3D and I said, let's make a 3D. So we made it and it, it's green when it comes out of the mold. That's the expression we use for it hasn't cured yet. Right. So I took a pallet knife and I sliced off the top block and the bottom block. And I moved the body sideways and I calculated a certain amount of distance. And then we glued the caps back on. We had an upper cap and a lower cap. That's why it's 3D. So now I, because my theory was if if you're only going to move part of the mass of the core, which was a five pound core at the time, 
Mm. We're up to seven pounds now, okay. but we're five pound core at the time, pound in the upper, pound in the lower and three in the body. So I figured I could shift the body further if I only moved three of the five pounds. Sure. So that's what I did. So I shifted it and I pressed it back together again and we made it. And that was the first 3D offset. Wow. So we're doing the Megabucks tournaments out in Vegas that year. And uh, Wes is bowling in the tournament because he was a pretty good player. Okay, so Wes was bowling in the tournament and it was two o'clock in the morning. Not that anything ever happens at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> in the bowling industry. Right. Anybody that's been a bowling alley rat understands the joke there. Right. Okay, so it's two o'clock in the morning. And he has got a 3D offset in his bag. So he went to the proprietor or the manager there and he said, we just got done with the last squad. We're not going to bowl till 7.30, till 9.30 in the morning. Can you turn on a pair? I want to throw a ball. So we turned on a pair. And the uh, first ball was through with the 3D offset, which had the same cover as the original, as the 3D he was throwing, ball went by the head pin on the left from where he had been standing. Mm -hmm. So he makes his five and two <laughs> quickly left. And when he makes his five and two, ball goes flush and goes through the rack. Okay. And a gentleman was standing about, I don't know, 30 feet from us in the bowling center that comes running down the concourse, jumps over the said to area and went under the approach and said, what was that? <laughs> and Wes said, that's just, just, I just threw a ball. I, I want to throw another ball with a ball I brought with me. That's all. It's just a 3D. And he looked at me, he looked at Wes and he said, you're a liar. <laughs> well, that person was Del Warren. Ah, okay. So that was the first time that we knew we had something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. if you understand physics and you had an equation that said something was equal to mass times distance squared, okay? Okay. What's the most important factor in that equation? I think you're, you're are you talking about the um... MD squared? Yeah. If you've got an equation that, that says that what you're looking for is equal to mass times distance squared, distance is more important than mass by a factor of D. Now that distance is how far is are things moved inside the ball? Because I, core shape determines motion. Sure. Everybody keeps trying to make cover stocks more important than they are. And they are critical because they are the tires on the engine. But the engine is the ball design, the core design, and, and now we got multiple layers of, of core design. So I knew at a very young age that core shape determines motion. Cover stock has its job. If you look at the bowling ball like a race car, the motor is what's inside and the cover stock are the tires. I knew that at a very young age. And Danny Speranza gave me one of the biggest compliments of my life when he left the USBC and went to work for Columbia, be in charge of R&D at Columbia. When he first went there in 97, Mike Albritton, who was another good guy in the industry, we've had some pretty good guys working in this industry, said to him, he says, I don't know what's going on, but I want to find out what's going on with this 3D offset. Because in 1997, there was at least one purple ball on every ball return in the United States. Wow. Were you bowling at that time? I was not. No, you weren't? Well, there was. I Ask believe the you. people over there. I believe you. And Danny Speranza went back to that meeting because I went back to help Columbia. I've, I've been around the world a few times. I kind of get used up and then move on and use up. But I think I'm sitting here for the, for the next few years and the rest of my career, actually, because... I'm only 78, so I've got a lot of long, long ways to go yet. So Mike Albritton said to Danny, says, I don't know what's going on with this, with this ball here, but I want you to figure it out. 
And Danny threw it for about two or three weeks. And then Mike went back to his meeting with Mike. And uh, Mike says, well, what's going on? He says, I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you one thing. That when that ball gets to 38 feet, I can tell you whether I'm going to strike or not. <laughs> That's one of the biggest compliments that anybody ever, ever paid to me. So that was the beginning of <clears throat> the 3D offset. That went on for a while. And then we left Fabal, and the name comes up again, Phil Cardinale. Right. Comes to Rich Saddles, who was my partner, and I at the time, and said, let's go to Vegas. I got a proposition for you. But Cardinale, who was then at track, which was owned by Columbia by then, because Paul C. got sold into Columbia. So he said, let's do a ball company. And that's where Mowrich started. So Phil's been there in the beginning was there in the middle, and he comes back again. You guys have intervie interweaving destinies. And we're both left-handed. And you're both left-handed. That's correct. Remember yeah. what I told you. Mm -hmm. There are five things I can do with my right hand. I'm assuming counting cash is one of them because you guys have been very successful with the radical stuff. So he comes to you and says, let's do Mo Rich Balls. So I saw some of the commercials you guys did on the internet. How long did that go for? Well, we did Mo Rich from 2001 to 2012. Okay. But that's when bowling, bowling balls, and bowling ball manufacturing got big. And Storm was the first one to come up with the modern idea with their cover stock and everything when they did the virtual gravity. Mm -hmm. That changed the whole game. And they got successful doing that and they're still doing it because they take care of their customers. You got to give them credit for that. Okay. And uh, we're going back and uh, I noticed that our ball sales had been dropping. But what I didn't realize was we had most of, or we had a lot of the better bowlers in the country throw in Mowridge. Okay. I think a lot of them will tell you there's a Mowridge ball in their past somewhere whether it's the Labyrinth or, or the Colossus or one of the other balls along the Motorich line. But our sales have been dropping. And the reason was the companies were putting our customers on their staffs because they decided if we put staff, if we increase the number of staff members we got, we can sell more balls. So they were using bowlers to sell balls to bowlers. And our sales had dropped off because that was the bulk of our business. Gotcha. Was the higher average bowler. Because they seemed to know the difference or notice, a lot of them noticed the difference with motor stuff. So in uh, February of 2012, I'm sitting home, my phone rings. Gentleman on the other end of the line by the name of Brian Graham. He says, I think you and I ought to talk. Why don't you come to Muskegon and we'll talk? So I went to Muskegon, we talked. And in January of 2013, I became the ball technology developer for Radical Bowling Balls. And that's where we are today. Fan. Bill manages the business end of it and does a great job doing it. He knows how to get people's attention. Uh, I report directly to Brian Graham because I because that's who I report to. And now, I got Randy Tideloff back. That's I'm enjoying my position right now. Fantastic. And that is a great place to conclude the first segment. Bowlers, I want to tell you, there's a second part to this story. Make sure you stay tuned onto the Radical Fan page and to Bowlers Rant. More to come. It's hard to believe, but there's more to this than what's going on now. And uh, I've been sitting home for a month. I got home on March 26th. And I haven't been in the same place for this many days in a row since Moby Dick was a guppy. 